Hey, what's up Seekers, welcome back. I'd like to wrap up this series on Maimonides by presenting some final pieces of the puzzle in our grand case for Maimonides' mysticism. We're going to present here today Maimonides' notion of divine illumination, following which we're going to look at Maimonides' emotional religious expression and see if he really was the hard cold cut rationalist that some have made him out to be, and lastly we're going to turn to Maimonides' negative theology, his idea that the human cannot adequately affirm anything at all about God. And hopefully by the end, we'll see how all of these pieces come together. Let's go. This episode is brought to you by you. If you would like to support this project, please head over and join us at patreon.com seekers. There are certain key words and phrases which, while not being exclusive to the vernacular of mysticism, function as telltale signs of the mystical at play. We've already pointed to a few of these that conspicuously show up in Maimonides' writings in the last episode, words like desire and bliss, bonding and union, and phrases like standing before or encountering God and being in God's presence. We're going to add some more to that list now as we build up our linguistic artillery in defense of Maimonides' mysticism. A key word, theme, and motif that features ubiquitously across mystical traditions is light and the concept of illumination. Light features in mysticism as a metaphor and symbol, as an instrument for ritual and devotional practices, and as a key feature of countless mystical experiences. It features prominently in Zoroastrianism, in the Greco-Roman mystery religions, in Greek philosophy, in Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Manichaeism, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in Hinduism and Buddhism, to name only the most obvious. Light is almost taken for granted as the most natural symbol to represent God or divine illumination and is associated with knowledge, wisdom, insight, justice, and goodness. And the process of coming to know the truth about ultimate reality is appropriately called enlightenment or illumination, to see the light. Terms used interchangeably with seeing clearly, waking up, realization, understanding, liberation, revelation, or salvation across the world's mystical traditions. Simone Weil, the mystical activist and philosopher, tells us of two forces that rule the universe, light and gravity, and speaks of the light that floods the soul in proportion to our efforts of attention. And Rumi, in the 13th century, spoke of the light which streams to us from all things, of the many different lamps in existence all sharing the same one light, endlessly emanating all things. One turning, burning diamond, writes Rumi, Ground yourself, strip yourself down, to blind loving silence. Stay there until you see you are gazing at the light with its own ageless eyes. Maimonides' writing in 12th century Spain and later Egypt receives his fair dose of light symbolism from both Judaism and from Islam. Judaism, going all the way back to the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, is replete with metaphors of luminescence from the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, when God affects the first act of creation by uttering the words, let there be light, yehi or, creating a light which according to the Midrash, God hides away until the end of days for the righteous, a light by which they can see from one end of the earth to the other. To the psalmist who refers to God as my light and salvation, for with you is the fountain of life, in your light do we see light, and for you will light my lamp, you, my God, light up my darkness. To the prophet Isaiah who beckons us to walk in the light of God and who speaks of the day when the sun and moon will no longer be our sources of light, for God shall be your everlasting light. Light as a positive symbol, writes Ravadin Steinsaltz, is so prevalent in biblical Hebrew that redemption, truth, justice, peace, and even life itself shine, and their revelation is expressed in terms of the revelation of light. In Jewish mysticism, of course, the motif of light shines forth prominently with one of the main ways that the Kabbalists refer to the manifestation of God being or in Sof, the infinite light. A motif even reflected in the names of the greatest works of Jewish mysticism, such as the Sefer Habahir, the Book of Brightness, and the Holy Zohar, the Book of Brilliant Radiance. And these allusions to light in the title of these great works is not a coincidence, but is rather central to the mysticism of the Kabbalists. That's on one side, on the Jewish side. On the other side, we have the tradition running from ancient Greece, from the Greek mystery religions, where the initiate was initiated from darkness into light, and experienced a divine manifestation, a theophany of light. 
to Greek philosophy, where the symbol of light takes on the connotations of goodness and intelligibility. In Plato's Republic, it is the philosopher who crawls out of the shadowy cave to see the light of day, transforming the symbolism of light, if we can speak in broad enough strokes, from an earlier conception in which it represented life, to a later conception amongst the philosophers where it represents consciousness, reason, and rationality on both the cosmic and individual level. This symbolism of light, a light by which we see true reality, spills over from the Greek Platonic philosophical tradition primarily via Middle and later Neoplatonism into the worlds of Hermeticism and Gnosticism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Islam, to get a little more specific, had its own primary sources of light. Like the 35th chapter in the 21st surah of the Quran, the verse of light in the chapter of light, the source of one of the 99 names of God in Islam, An-Nur, the light. When, after the 9th century, Neoplatonism was adopted into Islam, first with Al-Kindi, but more fully with Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, the Platonic light of reason and consciousness becomes identified with the divine light, which emanates from God through the cosmic spheres into our world, by which the human can intelligize and ascend back to the source of light, to God. This theme of divine light is expounded upon by many Muslim philosophers and mystics, besides for the ones we already mentioned, but perhaps none more than by Shahab al-Din Suhawardi, a contemporary of Maimonides, with his philosophical school of Illuminationism built entirely on an ontology of light and a metaphysics of illumination. Maimonides swimming in both these luminescent worlds of Judaism and Islam continues the brilliant traditions by adding his own points of light to the tapestry to this growing chorus of light. We see Maimonides dabbling with this imagery of light on numerous occasions, Maimonides in his introduction to the guide, as a metaphor for moments of illuminated clarity that come and go throughout one's life, paints a picture of lightning that illuminates the scene on a dark night, describing the individual on their journey of life as one in a very dark night over whom lightning flashes time and time again. He writes, Sometimes truth flashes out, as bright as day, but then matter and habit in their various forms take over and conceal the light so that we find ourselves again in a dark, obscure night, back to where we started. But at least now we have seen the light, and although we stumble in darkness, we may direct our stumbling in the direction of the path whose trace we still but barely see in the absence of the light. Maimonides continuing this imagery and metaphor of light and darkness towards the end of the guide contrasts those who have glimpsed the light with those that have no knowledge of the truth of reality in his language God, writing, Those who have no knowledge of God are like those who are in constant darkness and have never seen the light, as the verse says, And the wicked shall be silenced in darkness, while those that have the knowledge of God and have their thoughts entirely directed toward that knowledge are, as it were, always in bright sunshine. Here we have two instances, amongst others, from Maimonides' writings where he makes use of this imagery of light, which, in these contexts, becomes associated with awareness, clarity, direction, and knowledge, particularly knowledge of God. Let us try to situate Maimonides' poetical imagery of light in its proper historical philosophical context. We spoke in an earlier class about the way which Maimonides and his contemporaries merge and synthesize elements of Neoplatonism and Aristotelianism together, often even unbeknownst to them. And in another class, we presented Maimonides' Aristotelian theory of knowledge, his epistemology, deriving primarily from Aristotle's De Anima on the soul. At one point in the third part of De Anima, Aristotle compares the function of the active intellect with that of light. This analogy made by the master opens up an interpretive floodgate, to quote Sarah Pesson, for the Neoplatonic influence readers of Aristotle, and a bridge between Aristotle's notion of the separate immortal intellects to the Platonic and later Neoplatonic emanationist and illuminationist universes, sparking active links in the reader's mind to the many times that the divine emanative substance is depicted in the Neoplatonic corpus with the metaphors of light, both in its original Greek context and in its later Muslim reception at the hands of Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, particularly in their depictions of the influence of the active intellect on our sublunar world and our minds. It's quite likely that it's from here, from this Neoplatonic Aristotelian merger, that we get the idea that the human mind is illuminated in the act of thinking, namely that the divine active intellect pours its light upon the mind, and it's from here that we may even get our notion of enlightenment.
For Maimonides, as for his Islamic predecessors, to quote Sarah Pesson one more time, active intellect is like a light. It is the overflowing, illuminating fund of human intellection and prophecy. These thinkers that we're discussing, inspired by the one of comparison that Aristotle makes between the active intellect, which activates thought, and light, which converts colors from potential into actuality, from darkness into visible light, these thinkers go on for centuries actively working to combine their Neoplatonic, radiant, illuminationist, emanative epistemology with their sophisticated Aristotelian epistemology and psychology, that of the union of the subject, object, and process of knowledge, and the results are, shall we say, quite brilliant. But the real question is, can we move past the mere symbolism of light and these luminous analogies to find in Maimonides an actual epistemology of enlightenment akin to the mystical, a theory of knowledge in which the knower comes to know something immediately and intuitively, like a lightning flash upon the mind, something which might actually force us to consider his thoughts on thinking, his epistemology, in the light of mysticism. Let us back up for a second and explain what we mean by a mystical epistemology, a mystical theory of knowledge. In Bertrand Russell's famous essay on mysticism and logic, he delineates what he believes are the four key characteristics of mysticism. The first on his list of four is what he understands to be the epistemology of mysticism, mysticism's theory of knowledge, which he believes is predicated on the distinction between intuition and reason. Mysticism, insofar as its epistemology is concerned, denotes for Russell the belief in the possibility of a way of knowledge, which might be called revelation or insight or intuition, as contrasted with sense, reason, and analysis. The belief in a way of wisdom, which is sudden, penetrating, and coercive, which is contrasted with the slow and fallible study of outward appearances. Does Maimonides' theory of knowledge have place for such a way of acquiring knowledge? In other words, is Maimonides' epistemic theory properly mystical in nature? The evidence does indeed seem to indicate so. In the opinion of Alfred Ivry, one of if not the most prolific scholars on Maimonides' philosophical sources, Maimonides does indeed teach the concept of an act of knowing which is immediate and intuitive, a type of knowing which goes beyond that couched in rational propositional logic, a knowledge which reaches out in a-rational ways to comprehend the rationally incomprehensible. And Ivry believes that Maimonides would have found this notion in the thoughts of Plotinus, as filtered through the so-called theology of Aristotle, which we discussed at length in an earlier episode. And, as we saw in both Maimonides' introduction to his guide and in its closing chapters, bookending his great work with this theme of light, we find Maimonides speaking openly about moments of sudden lightning-like flashes of inspiration illuminating the mind, and of the perfected individual who doesn't take their mind off God, who is, as it were, always in bright sunshine, experiences which are not meant to be synonymous with normative acts of intellection in Ivry's learned opinion. It does seem, in fact, that Maimonides is not only using this imagery of light as a poetic metaphor, but as an actual epistemic theory of a way of coming to immediate knowledge or a clarity of knowledge that perhaps may be considered properly mystical. Moving on from light, the next theme to take note of is Maimonides' raw religious emotion. Now, while one does not need to be a mystic to experience and to exhibit religious emotion, one may indeed be a religious rationalist who catches feelings, at the very least, examining the role of emotion in Maimonides' religious life and writings will dispel the myth that he was a cold rationalist, and we will build up from there. Speaking of the biblical obligation to love and fear God in his Laws of the Foundations of the Torah, chapter 2, Maimonides writes, In what manner does one come to love and be in awe of God? And Maimonides answers, When one meditates on God's wondrous majestic works and creations, and sees in them God's transcendent boundless wisdom, one will immediately come to love, praise, and glorify, and passionately desire to know the great name of God. As King David writes, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. And, as one further contemplates these things, immediately they will recoil backwards in awe and fear, realizing that they are but one small creation, lowly and obscure, standing with limited knowledge in the presence of the one who is of perfect knowledge. What we have here is not only an expression of Maimonides' serious religious emotion, of which we will cite a few more examples soon, but we also find here a statement of his priorities, his hierarchy of values. Maimonides effectively teaches here that knowledge of the world isn't an end in itself, but an opportunity to meditate upon it, so that it will bring to a love and fear of God. 
And we might even be able to go one step further and say the same for Maimonides' stance on knowledge of God, God's self. The objective of obtaining correct knowledge of God, in Maimonides' view, is so that the individual may meditate upon that knowledge of God and be brought to a correct love and awe of God. As David Fried writes, rational philosophic knowledge is a prerequisite for the love of God. One cannot meditate upon the idea of God if one does not know what God is, or as Maimonides himself writes, in accordance with the knowledge, so is the love. Diana Lobel draws an insightful analogy here between Maimonides' twinned emotions of love and fear of God, and the way that nearness and knowledge of God bring simultaneously to both, almost as if pulled in on the inhale and recoiling on the exhale. Lobel compares these twinned emotions with Rudolf Otto's famous depiction of the two poles of religious experience, the Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans, a fascination and powerful attraction to the divine, and at the same time a recoiling in terror before the tremendous mystery of God. Maimonides, Lobel writes, describes a special worship that culminates in passionate love and awe. For Maimonides, this state of transcendent love and joy arises through intellectual communion with the divine and dazzling wonder at what the intellect can and cannot fathom. Hold on to that point for a second because we're going to return to it in just a moment. The next classic example of Maimonides' passionate love and emotion for God comes from his Mishneh Torah, Laws of Repentance, chapter 10. He writes like this, again posing a question. What is the proper way in which one should love God? And Maimonides answers, One should love God with a great and powerful love, until one's soul is tied up with the love of God, until it is madly obsessed, as if it were lovesick with God, like a person in love with a woman in which their thoughts are never free from thinking of her, like one who is obsessed with their love, thinking of her at all times, when they rest, when they rise, when they eat, and when they drink. Even more than this should be the love for God in the heart of those who love God, constantly meditating upon God, as God commanded us to love God with all your heart and with all your soul. And this is what King Solomon said by way of allegory, Ki chaylas ahava ani, for I am lovesick for you. The whole Song of Songs being an allegory for this subject for the love between mankind and God. Maimonides here, writing in a legal context, mandates the individual to be madly in love with God, reflecting what he writes in Guide 351 about the perfected person who is not able to think of anything else at all but the object of their love of God, to be consumed with a passion for God whose overwhelming presence is ungraspable, ever leaving us wanting more. As opposed to a dry, cold, and calculated rationalism, Maimonides presents us here with a passionate, lustful, and even obsessive love for God, both in his Mishnah Torah, where he codifies this passion, not just as some nice thing to aspire to, but as a real religious duty and obligation, a matter of Jewish law, and in the concluding crescendo of his philosophical guide, meaning to say that this goal isn't just something for the untrained masses who need emotion in their service of God on some lower level than those capable of a sophisticated intellectual worship of God, but rather Maimonides makes this passionate love, fear, and intimacy with God the centerpiece of his religious instruction to the most advanced students of philosophy, to the perfected person who has mastered all science and all philosophy, for both of them, for the ordinary Jew reading his halachic legal work in the Mishnah Torah, written for the masses, and for the elite reading the guide, Maimonides wants them both to make the obsessive love of God, in which the individual can think of nothing other than God, their final goal, both for the masses and for the elite. God, in Maimonides' intimate description in Guide 351, watches most closely over those who have God in their minds at all times, even, quote, when alone in bed at night, connecting their hearts and minds with God, and the highest expression Maimonides finds in all of Jewish literature to depict the final moments of bonding and union between the saint and God is the ultimate expression of that love, the climax of the romantic relationship between the soul of the individual and God, the death by a kiss, a burning moment of intense and passionate love for God. Maimonides' language here and elsewhere, bursting with romance, eroticism, and emotion, perhaps only rivaled historically by the depictions of poets, lovers, and mystics of their union with the One. Maimonides' depiction seems to find comfortable home amongst their ranks, raging against the darkness of the cosmos, burning throughout time with a deep love, a passionate and consuming love for God.
The last theme that I'd like to touch on ever so briefly is Maimonides' negative theology that we began to discuss in the sixth class of the series, just to jog your memory briefly. For Maimonides, God's being is so utterly unified that it transcends any internal divisions. As he writes, God, may God be exalted, is one in all respects, no multiplicity should be posited in God, for there is nothing that can be added to God's essence. This radical purity and unity, believes Maimonides, precludes us from making any positive affirmations about God. This position, a staple of mystical philosophy, is referred to as apophatic or negative theology, wherein all that we can say about God is simply what God is not, for to say anything positive would imply some sort of limitation of or multiplicity in God. Thus, God cannot even be truly said to be one, because that would limit God to the category of quantity. Likewise, to go a step further, God cannot even be said to exist, because existence implies a being in time and space, categories that do not apply to God, who for many theologians is beyond being itself. This is Maimonides' via negativa, his path of negation, in which God is so categorically different from creation that nothing of our categories can be applied to God at all. When we do affirm anything positive of God, Maimonides writes, all we're really doing is negating a negation. For example, when we say that God is one, what we really mean to say is that God is not not one, but not that God is actually one in any sense that would have any application of that word in our ordinary usage. This path of negation, the via negativa, expressed by Maimonides is a common path found amongst the world's mystics, who, in their attempt to come closer to God, conceptually strip away anything that is not God or cannot be applied to God in their minds in the hopes that when nothing else is left, all that's left will be God. Just for example, we find some of Maimonides' contemporaries, the Kabbalists, employing the same logic in their quest for God such as in the introduction to Tukhani Zohar, known as Pater Chaliyahu, which reads, Antu chad you God are one, but not in number, one but not in any numerical sense. Maimonides makes the same point emphatically, writing, Since it is well known that it is impossible, except through negation, to achieve an apprehension of that which is in a power to apprehend about God, and that on the other hand, negation does not give knowledge in any respect of the true reality of the thing which has been negated, all people, past and present, declare that God cannot be apprehended by the intellect, and that none but God can apprehend what God is, and that apprehension of God consists in apprehending the inability to truly apprehend God. Maimonides desperately wants his reader to know that there is a being whom none of the beings that is brought into being resembles, and who has nothing in common with them in any respect, and therefore all language applied to God is inadequate and erroneous. In addition to his biblical and rabbinic sources, Maimonides undoubtedly picked up a lot of his negativity, his negative theology that is, from Neoplatonism as we outlined in an earlier video, via the Islamic Neoplatonized Aristotelian milieu in which he was born into, and later perhaps also from the Ismaili thinkers that he would have encountered when he moved to Egypt. All that Maimonides can affirm in the final count is a god that is without matter and is simple to the utmost degree of simplicity, whose existence is necessary, who has no cause, and to whom no notion attaches that is superadded to God's essence, which is perfect, meaning that it lacks all deficiencies, of whom we can only apprehend the fact that God is. This theology of negation takes Maimonides' thinking away from more classic theistic positions, which tend to affirm all kinds of things about God, to the direction of a more mystical theology for which negation is, as we've been saying, a staple feature. Wolfson points out that Maimonides opens his guide with a dual theological aim. The first is to divest God of any bodiliness, and the second is to deny God of any positive attributes, as we've been saying, replacing the God of tradition with a God that has no body and about whom nothing can be affirmed. This Maimonidean project, Wolfson notes, if followed to its logical conclusion, would severely compromise the theistic fabric of Jewish practice and faith woven from the cataphatic, the affirmative depictions of God in scripture a point that the German-Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzweig perceptively expressed in the beginning of his Star of Redemption, when he describes the not-knowing of negative theology as the way that leads from a something to the nothing, and, at the end of which, atheism and mysticism can shake hands. Maimonides himself even perhaps hints to the radical implications of his negative theology when he writes in part 3 of the guide when talking about the Carbonauts, 
the animal sacrifices offered in the temple, about what would have happened if Moses would have called for the abolition of these animal sacrifices while the Jews were still in the desert, writing that it would have been like the appearance of a prophet in these times, in the times of Maimonides, who, calling upon the people to worship, would say, God has given you a law, forbidding you to fast, to pray, to call to God for help in your misfortune. Your worship should consist solely in meditation, without any works at all. With the basic gist of this being that it basically wouldn't fly, and Moses, like the Moseses which would follow after him throughout Jewish history, had to allow the people to continue sacrificing animals in order, writes Moses Maimonides quite controversially, to wean them off the human sacrifices their neighbors were practicing in the hopes that they would eventually suffice with something like flower sacrifices. The same way that another Moses, some two and a half millennia later, would try to direct his flock towards solely meditating upon God, and saw all of Torah and mitzvot as training for the individual to get there, but knew quite well that they weren't yet ready for it. It's curious to speculate about who this hypothetical prophet which Maimonides speaks about might have been. What? Maimonides was talking about himself? No, that's preposterous. Well, either way, it certainly seems like Maimonides clearly understood both the risk and radicality, the daringness and danger of his negative theology, and decided to push for it nonetheless. That he did so shows us how important it was for him that his people have an accurate philosophical conception of God. He chose his battle indeed and was willing to risk it all for it. Elliot Wolfson frames this battle that Maimonides faced quite beautifully as the conflict between the philosophical need to divest God of all figurative representations on the one hand, and the psychological need to envision God in imaginal form on the other. You cannot build a religion simply on negation, on apophasis, but if you resort to affirmation, to cataphasis, you might be just left with some form of idolatry. Maimonides knows this and leans, it seems, into the former, onto the side of negation, risking religion as the price for avoiding idolatry. Yet, despite Maimonides' fierce negation, he does teach that one can come in fact to be in the presence of God in a significant and meaningful way, and despite his theological austerity, he does, as we've been saying, make room not just for any but for a powerful emotional response to the presence of God and even for a deeply emotional relationship with God, a loving relationship with God, going so far as to describe and mandate this relationship of a lovesick person with the thought of their lover as that between the human and God. And these themes in Maimonides' thought, incredibly enough, of negation and emotion, given the meticulously consistent thinker that he is, actually don't come at the expense of one another, but in fact feed into and contribute to one another beautifully. For Maimonides, as we mentioned earlier, it is precisely the act of negation which clears the path for a genuine religious experience. As Lobel writes, the process of divesting God of false attributes brings humans closer to who or what God truly is. Only by stripping away ignorance can we approach genuine knowledge. Far from removing us from God then, negative discourse, as Lobel puts it, thus paves the way for authentic religious experience. Whereas other mystics may use the imagination as a tool to draw near to the divine, Lobel continues, from Maimonides' point of view there's a danger here. The being we seek to approach through our imagination may exist in our imagination alone. As Martin Buber writes, we listen to our innermost selves and do not know which sea we hear murmuring, ours or God's. Negative theology for Maimonides ensures that the being we worship is truly God, Stripping away all traces of our multifaceted, complex reality leads the mind to the barest glimpse of an absolutely simple being upon which the world rests as its logically necessary foundation. We cannot say very much about God, concludes Lebel, but what we do not say speaks volumes. And on the flip side, just as a robust negative theology is what's necessary to keep our God concept on target, and that which sets the ground for an accurate worship of God, an authentic worship of God, that secures an authentic direction for our religious emotion, it is only our emotion which is able to break through to God once our negation is in place. Maimonides is fully aware of and warns about the fundamental limitations of the finite human mind as it reaches out towards an infinite God. Even Moses, whom Maimonides casts as the most perfect human mind, the father of all prophets, whom Maimonides literally places in a categorically superior level of prophecy in which he, Moses, alone resides, the man whose mind never ceased 
faltered or wavered from thinking of God, who dies the kiss of death from God's own lips. Even Moses tells us the biblical text in the magnificent theophany at the end of chapter 33 of Exodus only sees the back of God and not God's face, which Maimonides reads to mean that even to Moses the divine essence is fundamentally unknowable. But while the mind, even the greatest prophetic mind, is severely limited in what it can know of God, the human heart, in its most expansive moments of love, knows no limits in what it can feel of the divine. And here we see the second side of the relationship between Maimonides' negative theology and his deep religious emotion, in which his negative theology functions not merely as a safeguard, but also as a catalyst. Maimonides' religious emotions of love and awe flow precisely from a recognition of God's overwhelming presence, which is inaccessible to reason. The heart kicks in precisely when the mind has reached its limits. As the Jewish mystics playing on the words of the Zohar say, late machshava tfisa beklal, aval siyuhu beruta deliba, no thought can grab hold of God, for God transcends the limits of the human mind, but God can be grasped by the yearnings of the heart, for the heart has no limits. This emotion and love for God isn't separate, by the way, from knowing God. The heart has its own way of knowing, and Maimonides indeed refers to this love of God as a way of knowing. According to the knowledge, so is the love, writes Maimonides, and we might add in the reverse, according to the love, so is the knowledge. Maimonides makes this correlation between love and knowledge of God even more explicit in Guy 351, as we've seen, cracking open the possibility for this other way of knowing God, namely through the heart, the emotional, and perhaps even the experiential, long after the mind, the propositional, has reached its limits. In Ivry's opinion, Maimonides would have encountered some of these alternative ways of knowing God through his exposure to the thought of Plotinus, the 3rd century father of Neoplatonism, whom Maimonides had access to via the misattributed theology of Aristotle. As we've been saying, Maimonides may have encountered in Plotinus' thought this way of knowing which was immediate and intuitive, which went beyond rational propositional logic, an irrational approach to that which cannot be rationally comprehended. Plotinus, with a good sense of poetry and humor, calls this direct way of knowing ignorance, an ignorance more sublime than any cognition, in which the individual realizes their fundamental unity with the active intellect, and ultimately with God, the One. Maimonides too, as we've been saying, teaches about this ignorance about the true nature of God, an ignorance which he also calls a form of knowledge, which, at least according to some readings, goes beyond the rational bounds of the intellect and leads the individual to a state of worship and love of God. Plotinus also calls this knowing state of unknowing a state of love. For Plotinus, it is in an act of love, pure love, that the one God emanates intelligible reality, and it is likewise in an act of love, beyond the rational boundaries of the mind, that the human traverses the cosmos and returns to the one, to God. In the final verdict, it seems that Maimonides indeed teaches and preaches about this human phenomena of unknowing, this state of love, and, in Ivry's reckoning, would have found the appropriate philosophical articulation of it in Neoplatonism and found the necessary religious backing for it in the traditional canon of Jewish thought to which he belongs. The latter of which Maimonides refers to as the love of his life, whose love has been his infatuation since his youth and the former the philosophical traditions as a foreign woman and rival wife, one of many handmaidens which divided Maimonides' heart and stole his time away from his first true love, namely Torah. To bring things full circle here, let us return to a quote from Maimonides which we cited earlier, bringing together hopefully these themes of blinding light, overwhelming emotion, and direct knowing, which we've been weaving together throughout this class. But first, give yourselves a pat on the back for making it this far. It has been a long one. Well done. Maimonides writes, All people, past and present, affirm that God cannot be comprehended by the human intellect, that none but God alone can apprehend what God is, and that apprehension of God consists in apprehending the inability to apprehend God. Thus, continues Maimonides, all the philosophers say of God, We are dazzled by your beauty and you are hidden from us because of the intensity of your brightness by which you become manifest, just as the sun cannot be perceived by eyes too weak to bear its rays. The best expression of this concept is from the words of the book of Psalms, L'cha dumya tehillah, silence to you, O God, is praise. <laughs>
There are three key themes here at play in this quote from Guide 159. Number one, that the human mind is incapable of apprehending God, and that apprehension of God is apprehending the inability to apprehend God. Or, more simply stated, the ultimate level of knowledge is the realization that one does not know. Number two, that in this unknowing, there is an experience of being dazzled by God's beauty, which is hidden from us because of the intensity of its brightness. And three, that the only adequate response to God's blinding beauty and incomprehensibility is silence, that the highest praise we can affirm about God is simply to remain silent and to say nothing at all. Let us briefly piece these three themes together, try to make sense of them, and show some of their predecessors and parallels in the history and philosophy of mysticism. The first, this knowing that one cannot know, is a motif which shows up amongst many mystics and philosophers across the world's traditions. The first appearance may well be with Socrates, to whom is attributed the saying, the only true wisdom is knowing that one knows nothing. Jumping across some centuries and cultures, we find the same words in the mouths of the Jewish philosophers and poets, this same idea expressed that the pinnacle of knowledge is that one does not know, tachlis hayadiyya asher leineida. And over by our Muslim mystical cousins, we have Al-Ghazali quoting the hadith which becomes a popular Sufi saying, True apprehension is the inability to apprehend. Glorified are you, who made no way for your creation to know you other than being unable to know you. What's the difference, you might ask, between the philosopher or mystic who's gone through this grueling path of negation and comes to the profound realization that they know nothing at all about God, and one who simply knows nothing about God because they never put any effort into finding anything about God out in the first place? According to Micha Gottlieb, the difference could not be greater. There is a huge gulf separating the individual who simply utters the claim that they know nothing about God and the individual who can give demonstrative reasons why they have no knowledge of God. The difference is akin to that between one who cannot see because of an absence of light and one who cannot see because of an overpowering light. For the person who expresses ignorance without reason, God's existence is simply an empty notion. God is absent. For the philosopher who has gone through the dialectical process of affirmation and negation, God's being is understood to be so transcendent and perfect that it overpowers their understanding and stuns them into silence. God is overwhelmingly present. Or, as Lobel puts it, the philosophers dazzled by God's beauty dare not speak, not because there is nothing to say, but because the tongue cannot possibly convey accurately what it seeks to express. They are dazzled by the intensity of the sun's brilliance, not by its absence. They are overwhelmed not by the emptiness of God, but by God's fullness. This fullness and overwhelming presence is described by Maimonides as a blinding, dazzling light, which leaves one in a perplexed state of awe and wonder. We can find parallels to this experience across the globe, be it in Philo of Alexandria, who speaks of a divine splendor so radiant as to be blinding, or in the writings of Pseudo-Dionysus, who in the late 5th and early 6th century, in his highly influential amalgamation of Neoplatonic and Christian thought, talks to us of a mystical darkness, of a god who is so utterly unknowable, whose essence is so utterly beyond our reach, that all our knowledge of god can only be an unknowing, a knowing simply of what god is not. Or again, amongst the mystics of Islam, who talk about the experience of the unity of God by employing the poetic paradoxical language of simultaneous dark and light with expressions like black light or a bright night. The Jewish mystics of the Middle Ages, likewise, playing on biblical verses such as Isaiah 58.10, talk of a luminescent darkness, a darkness which shines brighter than light itself, a light beyond light, the fountain of light itself, which the mystic, through a process of purification, can partake of, essentially becoming the light, this dark light in which the binary opposition between dark and light itself is overcome. And lastly, the 17th century Welsh mystic and poet Henry Vaughan writes, There is in God, some say, a deep but dazzling darkness. And we indeed have seen some of those people who have said it. From Philo to Pseudo-Dionysus, from the Muslim mystics to their Jewish and Christian brothers, they all seem to be partaking in this experience and lineage of bright, blinding darkness. And our main man Maimonides finds himself situated squarely between them adding his words, the linguistic remnants perhaps of his own experience, right into the glowing historical mix. The last theme which I promised we would unpack is that of silence. Now, the irony of speaking about silence isn't lost on me. Let's do it. Maimonides' silence, with which he pays tribute to King David, 
is no simple silence. It is a silence that comes from an exhaustion of words, from a throat run dry of articulations, from a mind driven to silence by endless verbiage, a silence demanded by the questions to which all the seas turned to ink and every paper to tree could still not hold the answer. It is these moments in which Maimonides is called to his knees in silent praise. To you, silence is praise, l'cha dumya tehila. And it's not as if Maimonides wasn't a man of words. I did a little calculation over at Safaria to see how many published words Maimonides had written during the course of his lifetime that have come down to us, writing across multiple decades, multiple continents, and multiple subjects with works on astronomy, logic, medicine, philosophy, theology, law, and commentary. Not counting his scientific and medical works, I came up to a conservative estimation of over a million words if I got my calculations right, approximately the size of Les Miserables, Infinite Jest, and James Joyce's Ulysses combined. Maimonides' silence is not an easy or lazy silence, his silence is hard-earned, a silence only indulged after all possible avenues of law and logic, rhyme and reason have been thoroughly, painstakingly explored. When language, which is the syntax of reason, breaks down, we are left with a very pregnant and concentrated mystical silence. We see the same silence, this rich, textured, pregnant silence, waiting to burst forth, whispered across many of the world's mystical traditions. Just to suffice with two examples, we have again the Christian mystic Pseudo-Dionysus, who we mentioned earlier, who basically introduced new Platonism to Christianity, and consequently had a huge impact on Christian mysticism East and West. Something kind of cool, actually, is that if you look on Wikipedia, at the bottom of the sidebar for philosophers, you have that influenced and influenced thing, which you can click on to expand. And if you click to see who Pseudo-Dionysus influenced, according to Wikipedia, it just says all of Eastern and Western Christianity, which is pretty baller. I don't remember seeing this written for anyone else. Let me know if you know of anyone else that gets this kind of unconditional treatment. Back to the point, though. So, Pseudo-Dionysus, whoever he was, writes, The higher we soar in contemplation, the more limited becomes our expressions of that which is purely intelligible. Even as now, when plunging into the darkness that is above the intellect, we pass not merely into brevity of speech, but even into absolute silence of thoughts and of words. We mount upwards from below to that which is the highest, and according to the degree of transcendence, so is our speech restrained, until the entire ascent being accomplished, we become wholly voiceless, inasmuch as we are absorbed in that which is totally ineffable. We see here that mystical ascent into darkness, into silence, absorbed into the dark ineffability of God, an ascending silence echoed hundreds of years later by Ludwig Wittgenstein, one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century, when he writes, my propositions serve as elucidations in the following way. One who understands me finally recognizes them as nonsensical. When they've climbed out through them, on them, beyond them, they must, so to speak, throw away the ladder after they have climbed it. They must transcend these propositions, then they will see the world rightly. Whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. Both of these masters, Pseudo-Dionysus and Wittgenstein, reverberate Maimonides' words, Praise be God, who at the moment that our minds contemplate God's essence, our understanding turns faulty. In the examination of God's works, how they necessarily result from God's will, knowledge turns into ignorance. When the tongue attempts to exalt God with words, all verbosity turns into ineptitude and faultiness. This is the spiritual vision of Maimonides, his journey towards a God which is so far beyond any concept or word that it shatters all categories of thought and articulation, leaving us wanting, desiring to know, in ways that cannot even be conceived or spoken. His inner path, culminating for a select few, in the depths of a silent divine kiss, in the depth of a silent contemplation of God, in every waking moment, up until the very last moment of one's life, which constitutes the mystical culmination of Maimonides' philosophy. Ground yourself, strip yourself down to blind, loving silence. Stay there until you see you are gazing at the light with its own ageless eyes. Thank you so much for joining us once again to learn. Thank you to our patrons who support us and allow this project to keep going. If you'd like to check out the rest of the Maimonides playlist, there should be a link somewhere here. Catch you next week. Until then, as always, keep seeking.